Grace and peace to you from God our Father, through his Son, our Lord, Christ Jesus. Amen, brothers and sisters. Isn't it nice to be heading into a bye week at 8 and 2 rather than 2 and 8? After the last couple of years of Packer football, it's nice to understand what it means to win a game again. How can we sit here on Saints Triumphant Sunday and talk about triumph, talk about winning, when what we're talking about and what the world is all looking at is a mass of graves. More than that, we, we look back at the saints, and Scripture has its own uh, record of saints. In, in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, uh, there is a long list of saints uh, that, that we ought to remember, we're encouraged to look at and remember their way of life. Um, but I want to just share with you what the end of chapter 11 talks about. After this long listing uh, of the heroes of faith, Abraham, Noah, uh, Joseph, Moses, at the very end of chapter 11, this is what it reads. Others, more other saints, were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Doesn't sound like a victory to me. On Saints Triumphant Sunday, we can be assured that in fact, those who've gone before in the faith have triumphed and brothers and sisters, we can look forward uh, to ultimate victory, but we're assured of that by two things. One is a recognition that there are two realities and also a recognition of our true heritage. The Jews in Jesus' day, you might get the impression or might naturally think that since they had a common enemy in Jesus that, that they were really unified, and they weren't at all. There was a lot of competition there uh, between different sects who were competing for influence, uh, who were competing really over different doctrine, who, whose doctrine was right. Uh, two very important and distinguished groups were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, and the way that Luke records the lesson uh, this morning is the same way that Matthew and Mark record it. It's immediately on the heels of another story that's familiar to you where the Pharisees went and sent spies to Jesus to try to trap him. And they asked him a question, uh, and it had to do with taxes. And I think it's probably one that we all can recognize and we all relate to a little bit. Is it right to pay taxes? And, and Jesus, in a very memorable way, says, well, look at, the, look at the coin. Whose portrait is on it? Well, it's Caesar's. And Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and to God what's God. We read there that no one, you know, everybody was amazed at his teaching. And so the Pharisees had been squashed. The lesson before us today follows in all of those three Gospels, right on the heels of it. And there's nothing there that gives you the impression that the Sadducees necessarily were trying to trick Jesus by this question. In fact, the question that they raise seems to be more almost like, well, Jesus is, is proving the Pharisees wrong with their teaching, and so we can step up, and if we can get Jesus to validate uh, what we're going to ask, and our views and our doctrine will gain some influence here. If you want to follow the, the question... And the, and the story, it's on it, Luke chapter 20. Uh, it's on page 1042 in the Pew Bibles. 1042. The Sadducees, amongst some of the differences, one of them was that they only 
uh, accepted the books of Moses. The first five books of Moses were, were it. Beyond that, were, it was just tradition, and it were, wasn't worth paying attention to. Uh, and so they're going to go back, of course, back to, to that law, to the Mosaic law, and they're asking a question based on that law. Some of the Sadducees, Luke says, who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said. Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. And that was, uh, that was the Leveret law of the Old Testament. Uh, in ancient Israel, things were reckoned really through the male line, through the husband's line. We would call it a patriarchal uh, society. And so the law was put in place uh, really to care for the women and really to preserve a family lineage. It was how inheritances were passed down. It was how land was passed down. Legal rights were reckoned that way. So if a man died and didn't have a son, a, a woman was kind of left out to dry and all of his property and, and all of his estate would just be hanging in limbo here. So you marry your nearest relative. Your brother was obligated to marry you. Seems ridiculous in our day. Um, but this is the way that it was back then. I suppose you pray that you got along with your sister-in-law, right, before uh, your brother passes away. But this, actually, the Sadducees will say, uh, is going to be carried out to a ridiculous extreme. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second, and then the third married her, and in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Since the seven were married to her. To make sense of that, you, know, you have to understand that the Sadducees, as Luke said, didn't believe in an afterlife. This is it. That was one of the doctrinal sticking points with the Pharisees who did believe. Uh, in an afterlife. And so they ask this question, <coughs> trying to show uh, how ridiculous the law here would be if carried out to this extreme in the next life. It, it, it makes questions impossible. It, it, it makes scenarios seem completely ridiculous. And therefore, in their own mind, uh, this proves that there can't possibly be a resurrection. Uh, otherwise, the Mosaic law, which actually is God's word, would have implications in eternity that are just unacceptable. Jesus gives them an answer. And this morning, it really tells us as if that's the way we think. We're doomed to lose here. We triumph in Christ when we recognize the realities that are kind of a dual reality here. And that's the first thing Jesus points the Sadducees to. Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die. They are like the angels. Jesus said, there's this age, and there's that age. This age and that age really ain't got nothing to do with each other. So the question the Pharisees were posing about marriage and marriage law did not apply, does not apply to that age. Kind of blows their whole way of thinking up. And brothers and sisters, it's worth taking note of. What defines this age? When you think of an age, we generally think of a very long period of time, uh, and maybe it's a period of time that has some dominant characteristics that kind of define 
what that period of time is. What defines this age? Ah, marriage, children, family, eating, working, driving, and everything that goes along with all of it. Bickering, fighting, in our marriage, disobedience, lack of respect from our children, sick days, fraud, being taken of advantage of in our workplace. people cutting us off, scraping our cars in the parking lot. Even cars are no end to frustration. But if you really want to boil it down, this age is defined by one thing. It's not taxed. It's the other one. Everyone who is born into this age has a common destination. The life that starts in our mother's womb is doomed to end. And there's not enough money in the world to pour into medical research to alter that destiny. And we all know it. That's this age. And we know why it is. We can observe it in our heart as we live in this frustrating age. We lose our cool when we're bickering with our spouse. We can't even believe it that our children would lie to us or be disobedient or conniving or sneaky. We lose our minds over the fact that people don't do the things that they need to do to make us happy. And we realize why we share the destiny that we all do. That's to say, it's sin, it's offense, it's anger, it's hatred, it's murder, it's immorality, it's death. That's all you get when, like the Pharisees, you get wrapped up in only this reality and forget about that one. And Jesus takes us to that reality and he reminds us that reality's got nothing to do with this one. That reality is going to envelop this reality. The timelessness that is there is going to lay waste this timed eon here. And so, brothers and sisters, true victory lies in Remembering our heritage, remembering how we've been reborn for that reality. And that's where Jesus takes the fair, the Sadducees. He says, They, those who are worthy of the next age, are God's children, since they're children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Jesus' answer is way better than the question, and that's 
not a surprise. We, we know our Lord Jesus a little smarter than any of the Sadducees. They go back to Moses' books and they come up with this ridiculous a scenario to try and prove something that's not true. And where does Jesus go? He goes right to the books of Moses to show them that they're all washed up here on this one. He says, you remember Moses. This is the guy you're quoting, right? Well, when Moses was first called to, to the job that he had on hand, you might remember in the wilderness of Midian when he was shepherding for his father-in-law. He says, I, I have to go over there and see this strange sight, for there is a bush that is burning and does not burn up. And he walked over there, and God spoke to him. He said, Moses, you're standing on holy ground here. Take your shoes off once. The kicks need to go. I'm the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God didn't come to Moses and say, I'm the religious tradition of those who've gone before. He didn't say when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were alive in this age, they, they considered me uh, a, a worthy path of uh, life. He said, 500 years after any of them have walked the dust of this earth, Moses, I am their God to this day. They live in that age, right now, alive and with their Lord. Jesus says, ultimate triumph over this age, over our own sin, over the death that yet clings to our flesh, lies in that age. Did you catch where he said it comes from? Kind of a heritage thing. Children of God, and he really redefines that, is particularly what he means, children of the resurrection. It's kind of a technical formula linguistically, the way that that's put together. And it really has to do, do kind of like with this, if you, if you think of your life as this sphere, maybe, that you live in, when you're a child of something, it says that the sphere that you live in is the thing that really defines you uh, and shapes you. Children of the resurrection. You realize what that means concerning this age? The ultimate destiny and the ultimate end of this age isn't the end. Because the resurrection negates death. It negates sin and brings us into a brand new age. Just as it has Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the saints before interesting that the one who spoke these words also spoke of himself as the resurrection and the life. He's it. We're his children. We live in the sphere of his influence and what he has done changes the way that we see everything. It helps us see the two realities and cast our eyes ever on that one rather than linger too long on this. For it's Christ who's taken every sin that we've ever committed, every angry, hostile word, every sin of disobedience in our youth, and for our kids who are disobedient to us. Every sinful thought, every, everything that defines what we are in this age, Christ took to the cross and buried it never to be seen again, never to be dug up by anyone, including his own Father, our Lord God. And three days later, when he walked out of the grave, he has introduced the reality of a new reality. That age that is to come, 
that we all can look forward to and put everything to rest that defines this age. There'll be no more tears or crying or mourning or pain or disease or frustration or hostilities or disobedient, obstinate children or angry spouses or bad drivers. All that defines this age buried so we can enjoy that age. What a glorious day. This is one of my favorites of the year. It's a day to remember Grandma. Without Grandma, who knows? It's a day to remember my mom and my dad. Without them, I don't know where I'd be. It's a day to remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, whose faith we share, whose reality that is now is the reality that will be ours one day. It's a day for us to remember that reality. Pray that we live with an eye on that reality so that this reality doesn't have its effect on us. God, keep all of us in the faith so that we can stand with Moses, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, stand with grandma, mom, dad, our loved ones gone before. Stand together with all of them in that age before the throne of our Savior God. All of us. Saints. Triumphant. Amen.